Uh, allow me to briefly look at the book, which at this point is becoming more and more visionary that you've written, uh, I guess over five years ago, Life 3.0. Uh, so first of all, 3.0, what's 1.0, what's 2.0, what's 3.0? And how's that vision sort of evolve, the vision in the book evolved to today? Life 1.0 is really dumb, like bacteria, and that it can't actually learn anything at all during the lifetime. The learning just comes from this genetic process from one generation to the next. Uh, life 2.0 is us and other animals which have a, brains, which can learn during their lifetime a great deal, mm -hmm. right? So, and... Um, you know, you were born without being able to speak English. And at some point you decided, hey, I want to upgrade my software. Mm -hmm. let's, let's install an English speaking module. So you did. And uh, Life 3.0, which does not exist yet, can, can up replace not only its software the way we can, mm -hmm. but also its hardware. And um, that's where we're he heading towards at high speed. We're already maybe 2.1 because we can, you know, put in a, an artificial knee, uh, <clears throat> pacemaker, et cetera, et cetera. And if Neuralink and other companies succeed, we'll be life 2.2, et cetera. But uh, <laughs> what, what the companies trying to build AGI or trying to make is, of course, full 3.0. And you can put that intelligence in something that also has no biological basis whatsoever. So less constraints and more capabilities, mm -hmm. just like the leap from... 1.0 to 2.0. There is nevertheless you speaking so harshly about bacteria, so disrespectfully about bacteria. There is still the same kind of magic there that permeates life 2.0 and uh, and 3.0. It seems like maybe the thing that's truly powerful about life, intelligence, and consciousness was already there in 1.0. Is it possible? I think we should be humble and not be so quick to make everything binary and say either it's there or it's not. Clearly, there's a, there's a great spectrum. And there is even a controversy about whether some unicellular organisms like amoebas can maybe learn a little bit, you know, after all. So apologies if I offended any bacteria here. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't my intent. It was more that I wanted to talk up how cool it is to actually have a brain yeah. where you can learn dramatically within your lifetime. Typical human. And and the higher up you get from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0, the more you become the captain of your own of your own ship, the master of your own destiny, and the less you become a slave to whatever evolution gave you, right? By upgrading our software, we can be so different from previous generations and even from our parents, much more so than uh, even a bacterium, you know, no offense to them. And, uh, if you can also swap out your hardware and take any physical form you want, of course, it's really the sky's the limit. Yeah, so the it accelerates the rate at which you can perform the computation that computation that determines your destiny. Yeah, and I think it's it's worth commenting a bit on what you means in this context also, if you swap things out a lot, right? This is controversial, but my current Understanding is that that you know life is best thought of um, not as a bag of meat or even a bag of elementary particles, but rather as in as um, a system which can process information and retain its own complexity, even though nature is always trying to mess it up. So it's all about inf information processing and. That makes it a lot like something like a wave in the ocean, which is not its its water molecules, right? The, the water molecules bob up and down, but the wave moves forward. It's an information pattern. In the same way, you, Lex, you're not the same atoms as during the first <laughs> time you, talked, you yeah. did with me. You've swapped out most of them, but it's still you. Yeah. And the, the, the information pattern is still there. And um, if, you, if you could swap out your arms and... Like, whatever you can still have this kind of continuity it becomes much more sophisticated sort of wave forward in time where the information lives on i i lost both of my parents uh since since our last podcast and and it actually gives me a lot of solace that this way of thinking about them they haven't entirely died because 
a lot of mommy and daddy's um sorry i'm getting a little emotional here but a lot of their values and ideas and even jokes and so on they haven't gone away right some of them live on i can carry on some of them and they also live on a lot of other and a lot of other people so in this sense even with life 2.0 we can to some extent already transcend our physical bodies and our death and particularly if you can share your own information your own ideas with many others like you do in your podcast then um you know that's the closest immortality we can get with our bio bodies you carry a little bit of them in you in some yeah. sense yeah yeah uh do you miss them you miss your mom and dad of course Course. What did you learn about life from them? If we can take a bit of a tangent, oh, so many things. Um, for starters, my my fascination for math and um, the physical mysteries of our universe. I, think I got a lot of that from my dad, but I think my my obsession for really big questions and consciousness and so on that actually came mostly from my mom and. What I got from both of them, which is a very core part of really who I am, I think is is um, this um, just feeling comfortable with not buying into what everybody else is saying, just doing what I think is right. They, they both very much just, you know, did their own thing. And sometimes they got flack for it and they did it anyway. That's why you've always been an inspiration to me, that you're at the top of your field and you're still, you're still willing to, uh, to tackle the big questions in your own way. You're one of, the, one of the people that represents MIT best to me. You've always been an inspiration in that. So it's good to hear that you got that from your mom and dad. Yeah, you're too kind. But but yeah, I mean, the real the good reason to do science is because you're really curious. You want to figure out the truth. If you think th this is how it is, and everyone else says no, no, that's bullshit, and it's that way, you know, you, <laughs> you stick with what you think is true, and 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 the, even if everybody else keeps thinking <laughs> it's bullshit, there's a certain yeah. I always root for the underdog <laughs> when I watch <laughs> movies. And my my dad once, I, I one time, for example, when I wrote one of my craziest papers ever, our math talking about our universe ultimately being mathematical, which we're not going to get into today. I got this email from a quite famous professor saying this is not only bullshit, but it's going to ruin your career. You should stop doing this kind of stuff. I sent it to my dad. Do you know what he said? <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he replied with a quote from Dante. <laughs> Segui il tuo corso e la sedir la gente. Follow your own path and let the people talk. <laughs> like, Go, Dad. Yeah, this is the kind of thing. You know, he's dead, but that that um, attitude is not. Uh, how did uh, losing them as a man, as a human being, change you? How did it expand your thinking about the world? How did it uh, expand your thinking about you know this thing we're talking about, which is humans creating another mm -hmm. living, sentient, perhaps uh, being. I think it uh, mainly did two things. Uh, one of them, just going through all their stuff after they had passed away and so on, just drove home to me how important it is to ask ourselves, why are we doing this things we do? Because it's inevitable that you look at some things they spent an enormous time on and you ask, the, it, in hindsight, would they really have spent so much time on this? Or if, would they have done something that was more meaningful? Um, so I've been looking more in my life now and asking, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? And I, I feel it should either be something I really enjoy doing, or it should be something that I find really, really meaningful because it helps humanity. And, um, <laughs> if it's in none of those two categories, maybe I should spend less time on it, you know? <laughs> The other thing is dealing with death up and personal like this. It's actually made me less afraid 
of, of um, even less afraid of other people telling me that I'm an idiot, you know, which happens regularly. And just mm, live my life, do my thing, you know. Um, and um, it made it a little bit easier for me to focus on what I what I feel is really important. What about fear of your own death? Has it made it more real that this is that this is something that happens? Yeah, it's made it extremely real. And I, you know, I'm next <laughs> next in line in our family now, right? It's me and my brother, my younger brother. But um, I mean, they both handled it with such dignity. It was, that was a true inspiration. Also, they never complained about things. And you know, when, when you're old and your body starts falling apart. It's more and more to complain about. They looked at what could they still do that was meaningful, and they focused on that rather than wasting time like, th talking about or even thinking much about things they were disappointed in. I think anyone can make themselves depressed if they start their morning by making a list of grievances. Whereas if you start your day with a little meditation on just the things you're grateful for, you, you basically choose to be a happy person. Because you only have a finite number of days. Yeah. You should spend them. Make it count. Being grateful. Yeah.